back with one chance and one chance only to land it at the proper place, put it right on the X mark on the runway. Dan, this flight has been been so perfect it's almost unbelievable. And when I think of the problems we have trying to simulate this flight, I'm convinced that the simulator is much harder to get up and fly and make a good uh, entry and a, and a landing than the spacecraft was. And probably that's the way it should be, because if it's tougher in the simulator, it makes it that much easier in the spacecraft, doesn't it? the mate to mate area that you may be saying to yourself, well, now what happens to this orbiter, which we hope will be going back into space. The Columbia, the first uh, space shuttle will be going back into space in late August or September. Well, the first thing that's going to happen to it is it'll go back on top of a 747 for transport back to uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Rhythmic applause begins for the astronauts as they near the crowd. Perhaps you can hear it. Over the helicopter noise. As the van uh, nears the crowd, the crowd breaks its uh, long line of ranks and starts moving uh, out toward the van. Of course, there's plenty of security here, and the, uh, the van will go to a prearranged area. The first thing is uh, you have the astronauts quickly go through medical checks and be reu reunited with their families, and then there'll be a little greeting for the crowd. At least that is the plan. This pilot here at Edwards since 1950, and he's flown all kinds of airplanes. Now, give us your best bird's eye view of that landing as it came in today. What did you think? It'd be pretty hard to fault it, really. I'd say it's about as outstanding as you'd hope to see. It's great. Was it any surprises as far as you were concerned? No, I think really uh, it was just exactly like you'd expect. Uh, the approach to the last part was just like it was done on the uh, launch and off the top of the 747. So uh, uh, you know, John looked like he uh, had a handle on it all the way from the beginning. the gem of the skies, we have surely progressed. That is a T-38, two uh, T-38 chase planes right behind it, and they are right close, so you can tell the difference in size. The landing gear should open, there it is, the landing gear is put down manually by the crew. Very critical, very critical timing, 19 seconds before the plane touched down. Two switches, one to arm, one to drop it. And if it doesn't drop manually, you've got an explosive charge back up. This is this just this moment right now for John when he touches down and for Crip have got to be a very, very sensitive moment. They are home. They have touched Earth. They have come back. And what a beautiful, sensitive landing, Gene. When you consider the weight and the size uh, of that vehicle and the manner in which it, it, it was, it, it, the tenderness of its touch as it came into poor landing. 75 tons. And you have to flare it exactly right or you bounce the gear. You'll stall it. You can even destroy it. It actually didn't take very long to roll to a stop either, though, did it? No, and I'm not sure he really applied too much yeah. in the way of brakes on that vehicle. Yeah. This is the videotape replay now of the uh, first astronaut, John Young, coming out of the uh, orbiter. He bounced out, as you see. They were on the ground for, uh, oh, about an hour before actually uh, coming out. And uh, Young then proceeded to just walk all around the place and have a look at his uh, spacecraft. Heading back there toward the uh, aft uh, assembly. It, uh, it's a hammered pattern. Uh, you get out of an airplane, uh, particularly one like this that you've flown on a special kind of mission, you want to see uh, uh, it was good to you. You want to see how good you were it to it in uh, flying it. You want to see what the tires look like, what the fuselage looks like. Was there any obvious signs of damage? All right, this is a live picture now. The uh, van is parked there. At, uh, you can see a, uh, of that flat square building there. That's a medical facility where we understand they will undergo 
a somewhat more comprehensive medical examination than they had earlier. machine and it performed a lot better than even he thought that it would you kind of itch to get your hands on something like the columbia orbiter i'd love it <laughs> <laughs> well i wish we could arrange it <laughs> but i'm not but i'm afraid we... <clears throat> that uh, the orbiter weighs 98 tons when it's uh, on the ground here as it is now that's uh, approximately so yes um i'm not a flyer does that make it tip over or weave back and forth or or what does it do i mean is the is the 747 less stable with that 98 tons which also has wings and an elevator on top of it well it does change the stability slightly but the 747 has such a margin of stability and safety already that when you add this to it and with the uh, the extra structure and the extra fins back here, you have an airplane uh, very near equivalent to a, seven four, to a standard airline configuration as far as safety goes and structure goes. Uh, this is a, you know, it's a special purpose airplane now. We don't use it for anything else except that. It's, re it's like everything else around here. It's remarkable to see the one on top of the other. You We'd know, like to show you now the building in which the astronauts are having their medical examination. Uh, there it is with a crowd nearby. That's the local dispensary. They're just going over their, um, they're draining blood, as Dr. Kerwin told us. They're measuring their height, uh, probably taking their weight, nothing more special than that. Maybe blood pressure, Joe? They'll do probably, the routine thing, yeah, sure. Standard things. And then after that, they'll be coming out uh, to go over to the VIP stands, where we hope we'll hear a few words from uh, Mr. Young and Mr. Crippen, who have accomplished such a remarkable uh, flight today. And we'll have more coverage of uh, this whole story after this. Here is the crowd uh, at the VIP uh, center. Quite a few people have uh, gone away, uh, naturally, once the Columbia came down and they knew that the mission had been successfully accomplished. But there are still uh, lots here. And if this is a shot of the VIP area in that uh, kind of circus tent, or garden party sort of tent, a lot are there. You know, Frank, we're out here in the middle of the desert, but uh, Edwards Air Force Base itself uh, has got quite a history of, uh, of uh, test flight experience, which has contributed to the flight of the shuttle. Many, many things have happened here over the years to contribute to the ability uh, and the development and the eventual flight of something like Columbia. It goes way, way back, Gene, to the early 40s when it was a secret Army Air Corps test site where the first U.S. jets were flown during World War II. Then uh, it became Edwards Air Force Base in the late 40s when Major Glenn Edwards, a, a heroic pilot, was flying one of the first uh, flying wings and got killed and crashed. Gentlemen, let's go to uh, Lynn Schur, who was down at the VIP area right now. Lynn, what was the reaction there? The same as everywhere, I suppose. Oh, absolutely, Frank. I think these people willed the plane down exactly the way they willed it up into the air in Florida at launch uh, two days ago. This is a huge crowd, as you can see. There's been a little bit of reaction here when the people up on the podium started to move the lectern to face the other way. The camera people, the news media, all, of course, wanting that terrific view of the astronauts when they appear here. Nobody is quite sure when they are appearing. We were originally told an hour and a half after landing, which would make it about 12 o'clock California time. Uh, we're not quite sure if that's, they're going to stick to that schedule or not. We are going to hear from both of the astronauts. Their wives will be here. Governor Brown will be here. Isaac Gillum, the director of Dryden Flight Research Center, will be here. Dr. Alan Lovelace, the acting administrator of NASA. Uh, Secretary Orr of the Air Force, as you General Robert T. Marsh, who's the personal representative of the Air Force Chief of Staff. Deserted. I think we'll be able to see mission control here. Do you see any human being in sight? I don't. I, they cleared out uh, shortly after 2.30 when they handed over control. Well, actually, about a half hour later, they handed over control to Dryden at about 2.30. They celebrated a bit in the control room. And uh, now they have left, and we're, we're told that some of them have gone home and, and gone to sleep. Uh, well, that could be understandable. Uh, I'm sure some of them have gone out to start celebrating. And well, there will be a change of shift briefing shortly. And after that change of shift briefing, we understand that there will be 
a few parties. A few the parties was the, was the term used. Yes, uh, one can understand that the fact that they didn't, it wasn't logged exactly when the control was handed over to Dryden, and I think part of the euphoria of what had happened there, the tremendous success. They got to success. look at the clock. They didn't look at the clock, which of course wasn't necessary to the success of the mission. But the mood was uh, very up here.